this is how we are going to cover the topic of governance. We are going to, in the first part, look at the political system, which is basically the form of government in this country. Then the electoral system, which is how our leaders are selected. And then we're going to look at the governance structure, basically how the country is run. We will then move to the second session, which is going to be group work. So in the second part, well, the first part, as I see it, is really more of an overview of, of the framework. The second part is where I will have you apply your minds critically to what can be done in the context of the governance deficits that we have in our country. So hopefully by the end of the session, you will have acquired knowledge on how the country is governed and you will be equipped for future and uh, public and political leadership positions. Is there anybody who would like to give me a definition of governance just before we dive into uh, the governance system? Um, this is an interactive session. We're learning from each other. You're a very knowledgeable lot, so please participate. Governance is the structure of how the government is run or an institution is run. Governance is a well-structured and institutionalized form of uh, decision making by a head of a state. The continuous process of giving strategic direction to a certain entity to ensure that it achieves its goals in the right time and with the adequate amount of resources. So Kenya is a unitary republic and a multi-party democratic state. It has a presidential system of government, a national government, uh, 47 county governments, and a bicameral parliament. Let's unpack some of the concepts on that slide. Okay, presidential system. A presidential system is a system that is governed with the president being the head of state of the country. Yes. What's another feature of a presidential system? He's the head of state and government. Mm -hmm. And the uh, president is also um, like the unifying factor in, 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 the in the country. What do we mean by electoral system? Electoral system is whereby we allow the people to exercise them, their democratic right and vote the leaders of their choice. According to my understanding, it's a way in which people uh, elect leaders or put uh, some kind of leadership in a country. I think um, the electoral system is the system that allows us to put our right to participate in political processes. Mm -hmm. The electoral system also determines what the nature of representation. So we have in Kenya what we call the plurality majority system, two variations of that parliamentary elections and county elections are conducted under single member plurality. Actually, in the old constitution, even the president's presidential election was conducted in the same way. Um, single member plurality is more commonly known as first past the post system. Can somebody explain to me how it works? Yeah, how do we choose our parliamentarians, our MCAs, our senators. Single member plurality is where a number of candidates would present themselves for a specific post mm -hmm. and then we the voters will go and cast our vote. Basically the first past the post will be the one who has the majority of the votes that will have been cast on that particular day. In first past the post, I'm looking for something about how the, the candidates are running under what? Like what is the, how is the country divided for voting? Constituencies, okay, right. So our electoral system, the country is divided into constituencies or electoral units. And then you've got the candidates vying the one who gets the most votes is the winner. The one who gets to the post first. 
right? That's why it's called first past the post. Yeah, so it's a very simple uh, electoral system which we inherited from the British. This first past the post system, it entrenches accountability of electoral representatives to the constituency, right? So you have your, you know who your MCA is for your ward, or let's say who your MP is. In a proportional representation system, it's all the votes in the country counted, divided by the parties. You don't necessarily have an individual who you can say, you know, this is my MP or who you can hold to account. So that's why, or that's an advantage, let me say, of the first past the post system. Let's talk about the presidential elections. I said in the old constitution, it was also first past the post. The problem with that, with that was, for example, I think it was the 1998, 92, one of those early elections after multi-party, the president won with about 30% of the vote, 40% of the vote. So how have we addressed that? We've got the two round voting system or the single member majority. Somebody explain to, to us how that works. <coughs> The two-round voting system works like this. For a president to win, they must have at least more than half of the votes in an election. If they are 50 plus one, if they do not get more than half of the votes in that election, the first two who get the majority of the votes, uh, they now go and compete together. So for one to win, they must have an absolute majority of the votes. Thank you. There's a second aspect of, of our 50 plus one. Up, you know, of, of our presidential election. Sorry, sorry, um, sorry. Again, I'm Nancy Okademi. It is 50% uh, in 24 counties. At least 50%. Okay, it is 50% plus one of the, plus one of the total vote. And at least 25% in more than half of the 47 counties, which is in more than how many counties? 24. Okay, okay. Okay, we got that? Okay. Ooh. Somebody will help me here. The winner, the presidential winner, should get at least 50% of the votes, vote cast plus one. So if 10,000 votes are cast, 50% of 10,000 is 5,000. The winner should get at least 5,000 plus one to be the winner. If not, then we go to round two with a two uh, popular. I would say popular in terms of the number of both votes they got, but and the 50% plus one, the presidential candidate should at least get 25% of votes cast in at least 24 counties out of the 47.
Kenya's devolved system of government is aimed at addressing imbalances in development and promoting the accountable exercise of power. Effective self-governance, equitable social and economic development, and public participation. However, the working relation between the national government and county government has been characterized by mistrust, suspicions and conflicts over allocation of financial resources. In addition, there is poor coordination and consultation between national government between national government agencies and county government agencies that has led to duplication and wastage of resources. So our question, what can be done to forge stronger intergovernmental working relations and improve coordination between the two, level, the two levels of government for the benefit of the citizen? Okay, first and foremost, as a group one, we wanted to simplify the question so we will uh, define the, the, what is devolution. We say devolution is the centralization of uh, the national government to the county government. In this case, we talk of the county government and the 47 counties that we have. Then what are these um, gaps or what are these challenges or loopholes? We say there were gaps and loopholes on uh, implementation of our policies. We stated uh, uh, these uh, gaps or maybe things that led leads to these uh, Conflict is uh, funding. Uh, we talked about separation of power uh, by funding women, uh, which we meant coming up with the re um, revenue collected by the county governments are taken to the national government, which is uh, then they are brought back through exchequer. So that like makes it uh, hard for the county government, where the county government collects their revenue that is taken to exchequer, then it's divided into the 47 counties dependent on their collection. We also talked of inequality. Um, the one, one man, one shilling. Um, then we talked of the marginalized areas, which feel left out due to during allocation uh, of resources. The solutions we had, the need, to, the need for clarity on the status and the roles of national state cooperation versus uh, the international relation reforms. So under section 34 of the act, it provides that, uh, it provides for mechanisms of dispute resolutions, but it also says that we as the people, we as leaders should also identify other mechanisms. So one of the things we discussed is coming together as professionals to ensure that we come up with dispute resolution. So let me come up, uh, let me give an example of the legal society. We have trainings as arbitrators, mediators, and we also have the judicial system that provides for alternative mediation. So also ensuring that other professionals have those kinds of systems and trainings which are open to people who are not even lawyers would enable us to identify those issues of dispute resolution, but also to recommend them to the national government. Which governance institutions are essential to ensure free, fair, peaceful and credible general elections. How we looked at that question as, uh, as a team is to break it down into three parts. Um, so why are we having these problems in the first place? And then who exactly is uh, responsible and who is in charge? And what do they do to promote this? So dividing it uh, like that makes it easier to answer that question. And so um, we all understand that an electoral process is not just the actual voting. There is a lot of pre, uh, during and post. So looking at all those angles, uh, we pointed out uh, a few issues that um, affect or bring, abo bring about problems during, uh, during, during pre and post uh, election processes. And one of them is uh, the perception of, uh, of electoral mal malpractices. There's always this perception that they're going to rig or we are going to rig and, and that, that really, really breeds now the contempt. And then there's the issue of voter bribery, which now goes into affecting uh, the turnout of the election. And then there is the media biasness that one media house is reporting is more inclined towards a certain side than the other. And then the, there is the social media incitement that is really growing. Uh, it, it was even published by BBC of how um, politicians are paying bloggers to just push their agenda, which is something so unique to them. But to us, it's normal that if you want to trend, you pay. And really, there is a lot of social media incitement, which is now negative. And then there is the aspect of uh, the winner takes it all. 
uh, mentality for Kenya because uh, it's a do or die situation now for Kenya. And uh, there's someone, one of the popular politicians was trying to say that uh, there are only about 4,000 elective posts and there are 50 million Kenyans. So if you don't win, just go and do what the other 40, 49 million Kenyans will be doing. And I think we need to really sanitize that about the winner taking it all. And then which are or who are the institutions that are um, mandated in this electoral process? And first and foremost is the IBC. And then there is uh, the National Police Service. And then there's Parliament, which you'll let us see on how it plays out in legislation. And then there's the judiciary in dispute resolutions. And then there's political parties, obviously, that is the primary uh, foothold of uh, the electoral processes through the National Elections Board. And then there is the um, National uh, Cohesion and Integration Commission that is required or charged with the peacekeeping of this country. And then there is the Ministry of ICT, which comes very key because our electoral process is partly manual and partly digital. So what do these institutions get to do to promote an, a free and fair electoral process? Number one is through parliament by timely passing of legislation that is required for the electoral process. And uh, for example, Article 87 uh, says that petitions should be filed within 28 days. I think w once they are passing such legislations, they should be timely. And even given the, the political amendment bill that was made the other day, now it's a law. I think it was made too close to the election time. And one of the requirements by the constitution is for them to make timely legislations ahead of the elections. And then there is the issue of ensuring security, which is paramount, and that is where the National Police Service comes in, because they are there to maintain law and order and to ensure that we actually have a country post the elections. And then the, there's the issue of um, IEBC and the political parties. One of the things we saw uh, with, the, with, the, with the primaries was that uh, the candidates were, they seemed to want an IBC election more than a party primary election. And how we can integrate IBC into pri party primary elections is one way of instilling confidence and reducing the, 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 I mean the amount of, uh, of, of disputes that come up after the election or even during the election process. And then these uh, political parties should be made more accountable to ensure transparency of elections. I think when, when they decide to issue either direct or indirect t tickets, it should be a unanimous decision and not other people, no, pe some people should not feel left out of the process. And that is uh, something the political parties really, really have to, have to tighten on. And then there is a uh, seamless uh, results transmission, which is now uh, anchored in the Ministry of ICT that should ensure that the gadgets are working, that the transmission is proper and it is fair and transparent. And then there is, um, the IBC, this is way before, to have proper demarcation of territories to ensure that, uh, that, that how they are demarcated is proper because how they are demarcated is what will uh, result to a senator, a governor, a woman rep and all that. And so ensuring that that is properly done, then the right people are in the right place. And then um, there is conducting thorough civic education. At least this is something which is paramount. It is so obvious. It is so good on paper, but the implementation has to be very heavily invested in. Parliament should allocate more, more money to uh, IBC to be able to have an enhanced civic education exercise. And then um, there is um, um, staggering the, the terms for commissioners in the IBC to ensure that at any one time there is quorum in IBC so that we don't have dispute resolutions and that, that are being put into question on the basis of a quorum. And then uh, there is um, the issue of building trust among citizens. I mean, uh, this, I think it comes with the entire process. And uh, I mean, as a stakeholder um, um, from institutions, when you're looking at IBC and whatnot, I think we Kenyans, the citizenry, have an obligation to being able to support the process and not to allow ourselves to be used for political violence. I just wanted to emphasize on this thing of staggering elections. Every time people talk about staggering of elections, they'll always give the excuse that it's a very expensive affair. I want um, to declare that I've been a returning officer twice. And the madness on that day cannot be handled. Uh, it's like imagining that you can build a house in one day. It can't work. So it's time we accepted as a country that we need to stagger this election. And the greatest fear is not even the amount. It's the other politicians who feel that once you put presidential election aside and you are through with it, 
then you the citizens might not be so excited about the other seats so i think that is the fear that is there it's not about money as such group three question while kenyans support democracy they are less satisfied with its performance of political actors and state institutions. According to Afrobarometer surveys conducted in Kenya, the majority of Kenyans, 70.5%, perceived an increase in corruption and identified corruption as one of the major challenges that the government should address. Global corruption surveys rank Kenya amongst the most corrupt countries in the world. Local studies estimate that the country loses up to 1% GDP per year or approximately one third of its national budget, which is 6 billion USD, due to corruption. What institutions have been established to curb the abuse of power and corruption? How can they inspire public confidence in dealing with corruption? Let me just start with corruption. According to Transparency International Board, corruption is defined as abuse of entrusted power of pri for private pay. So basically you are, you're, you've, given, you've been given power and then now you abuse it. Now that we understand what corruption is, as a county we are already ranked at number 128 out of 180 countries in Africa. So under Article 79 of the Constitution, it establishes the East Africa, um, sorry, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. Uh, before the ESCC was born in 2011, on September, the previous uh, constitution had the uh, Kenya Anti-Corruption Commission, which was disbanded for the ESCC to come into place. And now that we have that background, the institutions that are involved are the ESCC, one, and then the other institution are the Kenya Revenue Authority. How does Kenya Revenue Authority come on board? It tracks the public servants, the officials, the leaders, how they are transferring the money. The Central Bank of Kenya and the Kenya Revenue Authority have been mandated to check how much are you transferring. So you know, uh, one million, you cannot just transfer one million just like that before they start asking you, where did you get that money? Um, who, where are you taking it? Who are you taking it to? So the beneficial ownership will tell us who owns what and how this money was transferred, where did it go to? So the other uh, institution is the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. You've heard of Haji Nurdin, how he's running up and down trying to follow these leaders. The Director of Criminal Investigation helped with the investigation process. Without them, we wouldn't be knowing who's doing what, uh, where they're doing it, and if they've moved their money outside the country, and all that. County assemblies and the parliament, they are putting the leaders into accountability. You've been seeing them coming to the table and they've been questioning <laughs> all those leaders, right? So have the judiciary, which is supposed to be independent, it's supposed to be the one that monitors these leaders and now jails them, finally. So now let's go to the second question. How do we think that we are going to solve this problem? As a team, we came up with 10 beautiful points. One, expose these corrupt activities and risks um, that may remain hidden. Before these things used to be hidden, right now when we implement these processes, these things will be coming to public. And that's why you've been seeing this information coming to the public. You know who and uh, so-and-so stole this amount of money, where they stole. When, it's, when it comes to the public, the leaders are ashamed. They don't want to be associated with that corruption. The other point that was related to that, in China what's happening is that these officials are being put to test in the public. So if you're a dishonest leader, if you're all this, they are coming for you in public. So do you want the, all the group members and the people in mobs to start attacking you in public? So you will stop doing it. When you start doing sh uh, shaming of these activities, it will be able to be curbed. Also, whistle blowing process to be pro the whistle blowers to be protected. I mean, um, uh, our team member talked about hotlines that are um, anonymous so that you can do a private call without being tracked. 
I know Safaricom is tracking you on all these leaders, so you can't even come out in public and disclose, oh, there was this tender that they stole this money and all that. So if we give a chance to the citizens to come and disclose this information, then that will out. And then the other thing, yes, is improving the justice system. So one of the things that is inhibiting justice is delayed justice. How do we stop it? We ensure that this justice system, we have like a certain committee that just deals with corruption. And in that, we have free and fair, integral leaders or judges to be sitting there who cannot be corrupted. And also the feedback policy, um, ensuring that, uh, that the citizens can give feedback. Reflect on the Kenya national government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. How well equipped was the government to deal with a health emergency with far-reaching socio-economic effects? How can the government improve state capacity and strengthen governance institutions to deliver basic public goods and services and social welfare programs to its citizens in the event of a crisis and beyond? Building back a better COVID-19. Reflection. You will all agree that COVID-19 came as a shocker to this nation. So when we reflect, we realize our govern government was anxious just as the rest of the world. They had never been such in the past. So what we came to realize is that our government equally was reactive. We will also agree that there were no standard operating procedures. There was no budget because COVID-19 came at a time that budgets were being implemented both at the national and the county level. And then finally, if we reflect, we remember stigmatization was it. Uh, if you are found to be having COVID, one gentleman told me he was seated in an outpatient and all of a sudden he saw two men clad in white coming with uh, this prayer and in front of everyone and people had to be running. So stigma was one of the reflections that all of us can put in place. So how well equipped were we? One, we had no isolation units. 90% of the counties had no isolation units. So no one knew what would we do if we have a COVID case. Uh, we also recall that at some point there was a lockdown and this was a shocker measure. No one was prepared. No one knew what working from home is. So that is how the government, the government was reactive. So Kinaumana we move. Kinaumana we move. So, so we realized at that point so much psychological effects were evident. My marriages, you, you remember. Lockdown. So there are so many things that came up with the lockdown. So it came as a shocker. And the mental health issues now had to come up. Counselors had to be brought out from their comfortable zone. And I think that is what made us realize as a country that we were not equipped. But at some point, something good happened. We have to agree that at some point, we started getting equipped. And so this was our story. Despite the many losses of jobs, our president came up with the Kazim Tani, the tax waiver, all of us remember. The interest rates were frozen. We had zero rated investor loans. Something started happening. Then we came up with, uh, let's, let me not forget to mention that one of the, uh, the indicators of our not being prepared was our national security. All of you recall the Nakuru scenario, where curfew in Ipatam to Saa, at six, amazed to six, the person, the gentleman was going to Kisumu and then he was caught in between Nakuru. And we saw this policeman as if killing, killing a lion, started spanking this person. So I think at some point we also realized that even our national security was getting frustrated. So anything that was being said, they were just implementing without any procedures being implemented. But then the government came up with COVID, sorry, emergency response committees. This was in all the counties, and our president actually initiated it. He announced it as a national disaster, and so at the national level, we, the, the National COVID Emergency Response Committee was being chaired by both the, the CEC for Health and also in COG, that is the Council of Governors. So this was cascaded to the counties and we are the COVID emergency response committees at the county level. I was privileged to be amongst those in that committee. And in this committee, it was being co-chaired by the county commissioner and the governor. It brought on board even the other departments. Now health was no longer working in silos, agriculture was there. So it was an integrated team. And I think at that point we would say something started happening. No more silos were evident. Projects were prioritized in terms of health. I know this had an effect, and, and those in the assembly can agree to that. Validation had to be done. Because with a, with a budget that was already being implemented, we now had to shift that we are no longer doing public works. We want this money to go back to, to health. Leadership positions in, in Kenya remains low. 
This has continued to undermine uh, the national values and principles of good governance envisioned in, the, in, our, in our constitution. There is a glaring gender gap and, in, in, and imbalance in parliaments and county assemblies in spite of the constitutional requirement that not more than two thirds of the members of elective bodies shall be of the same gender according to Article 81B and other articles. We consider effective strategies to promote gender mainstreaming and increase the representation of women in all elective bodies in Kenya. So the question you mentioned was something on um, national values and principles of governance. And according to article number, uh, at number 10, the values include patriotism, national unity, sharing and devolution of power, the rule of law, democracy, and participation of the people. So how are, or what are the some of the strategies that we saw fit to make sure that women um, rise to the occasion of getting elected into this elected post. So one of them, uh, my group suggested that we need to ensure that the political party list have gender balance. Like the other day, Kenyan National Human Rights Com uh, Commission. I think on this uh, particular part of the article, if it's implemented very well, then we shall not be having women not participating in elective position because they're discriminated or they face lack of freedom because of their gender. It's not worth it.